right guys, I had just recorded this whole video without sound, so here goes round two <laughs> with my microphone on. So today's video is going to be just an exploration of a talk that Max Werthemer gave on what Gestalt theory is uh, to the Berlin Kant Society in December of 1924. I really like this address that it gives the very like philosophy of Gestalt theory. It gives a good image of that. Um, I think that Max Werthemer's uh, kind of philosophy is what I really care about. And this talk is one of the few sources that we have that really covers it well. Um, I'm also a big fan of the papers that he wrote later on, um, a decade uh, later and onward about truth um, and uh, ethics, democracy, and freedom for papers on those topics. And, uh, and some of those ideas are found in this um, talk. So... Uh, it has a lot of themes and it covers a lot of ground, um, so I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit about what's in it, and it's really a great text to go and read for yourself, and I'll link the source in the um, video description. The first part of this talk, he's really asking the question of what is science? What are the boundaries of science and the scientific method? And does science, as it is now, at, at that time, uh, in history and also I think applicable to today, um, how is it serving us in our understanding of reality? Um, so he says, we and, and um, pretty much all of the slides is direct quotes. These are quotes from his talk. I just kind of go through the talk and I've um, included uh, most of the important parts uh, just as quotes on each slide and then the heading is my own. So he says, we go from the world of everyday events to that of science and not unnaturally assume that in making this transition, we shall gain a deeper and more precise understanding of essentials. So he kind of contrasts everyday events. Um, a big concept of his throughout his life is the lived situation, um, the concrete situation. So he contrasts that with that of science and the scientific method. He says, though the, the transition from uh, everyday events to that of science should mark an advance, yet though one may have learned a great deal, one is poorer than before. And it is the same in psychology. Here too we find science intent upon a systematic collection of data, yet often excluding through that very activity precisely that which is most vivid and real in the lived, living phenomena it studies. Somehow the thing that matters has eluded us. Um, and so I think this is a really important point, and it does get to the heart of what Gestalt theory of Max Werthemer is about. He wants to get to the, the thing itself. He wants to get at reality, and much of this is um, related to phenomenology, talking about a phenomena. Um, so he, he is not satisfied with merely classifying and conceptualizing things. He wants to kind of ask what what do we lose when we only kind of abstract or try to break things down into its components? Um, does that kind of leave us the poorer um, as far as what we can kind of comprehend of the thing that we're trying to understand? Um, he says, we are told of formulation of concepts of abstraction and generalization of class concepts and judgments perhaps of associations, creative fantasy, intuitions, talents. What are these words but names for the problem? Where are the penetrating answers? Psychology is replete with terms of great potentiality, personality, essence, intuition, and the rest. But when one seeks to grasp their concrete content, such terms fail. And he says this is characteristic of modern science in general. Um, He's by no means anti-science. He, I think, was critiqued by others as being too much in favor of kind of objectivity in scientific research. So he definitely um, wants to honor scientific method, but he does ask, do we lose something in how we can understand reality or um, uh, is there are these limits that we need to pay attention to of what we can apprehend through um, the scientific method as it was um, kind of understood at, at the time. He says, several attempts have been made to remedy the matter. 
One was this kind of defeatism, preaching the severance of science and life. So this dichotomy, either between like life and science, that there are parts of life that just are not accessible to science, however you are defining science. Other theories establish the distinction and dichotomy between natural sciences and moral sciences. So natural sciences um, have scientific accuracy, things like chemistry and physics, um, but scientific accuracy has no place in the study of the mind and its ways. And he says, I, I'm not a fan of that option. Um, he says, let us consider uh, rather a question naturally underlying the whole discussion. Is science really the kind of thing we have implied? Um, so he's kind of asking, can science be more than just what we've uh, kind of understood it to be as this breaking down uh, into components? He says, the word science has often suggested a certain outlook, certain fundamental assumptions, certain procedures and attitudes. But do these imply that this is the only possibility of scientific method? Um, it is conceivable, for instance, that a host of facts and problems have been concealed rather than illuminated by the prevailing scientific tradition. Even though the traditional methods of science are undoubtedly adequate in many cases, there may be others where they lead us astray. And in the last part, he says, perhaps something in the very nature of the traditional outlook may have led its exponents at times to ignore precisely that which is truly essential. So he kind of says we're um, we're kind of missing uh, that which is really essential. We're focusing on something else, something true, but we've lost what, what really matters um, sometimes. <clears throat> and this is where he kind of talks about science conceived of as just breaking things up uh, into components. He says, it has long seemed obvious and is in fact the characteristic tone of European science that science means breaking up complexes into their component elements. Isolate the elements, discover their laws, then reassemble them, and the problem is solved. All holes are reduced to pieces and piecewise relations between pieces. So this is not what he is um, proposing. This is uh, what he's critiquing. He thinks that we lose out on understanding reality when we're always trying to, um, when we only see things as more deeply true when we're breaking them down. Um, we've lost what the whole is, um, and it's important for science to also kind of attend to the whole of, of things. Um, he contrasts kind of that idea of parts which are in relation, and parts of a whole, versus his use of the word piece indicates a time when he's talking about like isolated pieces that are not seen in the context of the whole. He says that science is poorer when it is isolating the things that should not be isolated from, from the whole. Um, he says, the fundamental formula of Gestalt theory might be expressed in this way. There are holes, the behavior of which is not determined by that of their individual elements, but where the part processes are themselves determined by the intrinsic nature of the whole. Um, and so this is really a philosophical concept. Um, this paper, as I said, I mean, this, this address that he gave is really one of the rare times that you can really see his philosophy. And I think that this idea of wholeness is applicable in so many ways to discussions and debates and philosophy. Um, the Gestalt uh, psychologist, Max Werthmer, founded in Berlin, they actually were doing much more specific kind of research than what this philosophy is talking about. They actually were very dedicated to a scientific process, to trying to find what are laws that kind of um, are at work in how we perceive. Uh, they were very much uh, concerned with perception. So they had a pretty narrow application of, uh, of this, but I think that this talk really just shows us Max Werthmer in particular, his kind of personal philosophy that drove Gestalt theory. So this philosophy is not the same as the actual research done by the Gestalt psychologists. What I'm really interested in this is in this philosophy of Max Werthmer. And so um, in this part of the talk, we really see that Max Werthmer is very concerned with uh, kind of paying attention to the thing itself to what is given in nature and how this is different than making abstractions, classifying things, um, 
uh, he wants to attend to or the reality of, of a thing itself. Um, so he says, this is not merely the, the proposal of one or more problems, but an attempt to see what is really taking place in science. This problem cannot be solved by listing pos possibilities for systematization, classification, and arrangement. If it is to be attacked at all, we must be guided by the spirit of the new method and by the concrete nature of the things themselves which we are studying, and set ourselves to penetrate to that which is really given by nature. Suppose a mathematician shows you a proposition and you begin to classify it. This proposition, you say, is of such and such type, belongs in this or that, historical category, and so on. Is that how the mathematician works? Why, you haven't grasped the thing at all, the mathematician will exclaim. See here, this formula is not an independent closed fact that can be dealt with for itself alone. You must see its dynamic functional relationship to the whole from which it was lifted, or you will never understand it. So he says that things uh, cannot just be isolated or abstracted um, from a situation. And this is going to be seen later in this talk and later in later works of Werthemer's, um his paper on truth. He also talks about how if we're to have a real effective logic, we can't just be using kind of abstracted syllogisms. We have to actually kind of think about how does um, how is my logic informed by the situation, the concrete lived situation uh, of the thing which I am thinking about. Getting to the truth of a thing, um, it's very important to think about its its lived situation, its context, and what is given by nature. Um, so rather than kind of just classification, uh, the nature of the thing itself. In this part of the talk, he's basically just referencing how this uh, conversation has been debated by so many people. It was uh, at, in my first video, I kind of go through a little bit of the chronology and the different thinkers and their debates over wholeness. This was a really big topic in Germany at the time, uh, trying to find a sense of order and meaning in a rapidly changing um, scientific development uh, time in history. Uh, as physics, as evolution were becoming more uh, understood in Germany, uh, in philosophy, there was a lot of grappling with what is wholeness, what is a part, what is a whole, um, what is a whole that is greater than or different. Uh, from the sum of its parts. He's basically saying, I'm doing my best to tackle this huge topic in this talk. Um, and he says, uh, even worse has been the cataloging attitude adopted towards them. What they lacked has been actual research. Like many another philosophic problem, they have been withheld from contact with reality and scientific work. So again, he does really prioritize um, scientific method. He just is really asking is our prevailing idea of the scientific method adequate um, in every way to understanding reality? Then he brings up this kind of classic example of are there limitations uh, to reconstructing experience from elements, from kind of like uh, classifications, descriptions, uh, concrete elements? Is there a way to like rebuild one's experience through those those elements, those pieces. Um, he says, one turned from a living experience to science and asked what it had to say about this experience. And one found an assortment of elements, sensational images, feelings, acts of will, and laws governing these elements, and was told, take your choice, reconstruct from them the experience you had. Such procedure led to difficulties in concrete psychological research and to the emergence of problems which defied solution by traditional analytic methods. Historically, the most important impulse came from Ehrenfels, who raised the following problem. Psychology had said that experience is a compound of elements. So Ehrenfels was, as I mentioned in my first video on the history of Gestalt psychology, this, he was this very important figure in the idea of a Gestalt, which is different than the sum of its parts. Um, Werthemer critiques him in later slides of this talk, but right now he's saying basically he made this really important contribution, raising the point that um, experience is not just reducible to, to the parts. We cannot reconstruct experience, basically. There's, there's something that is unique and given in an experience. Um, and that is very much a phenomenological perspective. Um, 
and so he uh, he says basically when we think of Aaron Fall's thesis on the one hand we're surprised at how it is still too summative it's still too um it's not holistic enough um so Werthemer has critiques of it and, and I'll talk a little bit about that but he says on the other hand one admires his courage in propounding and defending his proposition, and he finds it a, a very important idea. And um, and so I'll just kind of read it and try to explain it. Um, I think that he does have a very similar viewpoint to Aaron Fells. I think he's just kind of describing a little bit of a, a difference, a kind of nuanced distinction. Um, Aaron Fells' position is this. I play a familiar melody of six tones and employ six new tones, yet you recognize the melody despite the change. There must be something more than the sum of six tones, a seventh something, which is the form quality or the gestalt quality. Um, it is the seventh factor or element which enables you to recognize the melody. So that's Aaron Fells' position, and Werthmer is basically saying, well, Aaron Fells is still just kind of plopping it. Uh, the wholeness, the quality of wholeness, or the gestalt quality, as the seventh thing, the seventh part. Um, and and Aaron Falls says that um, basically um, uh, relations between elements um, is this additional component of the total, of the whole. Um, but this view failed to account for the phenomenon. Um, because in some cases the relations may be altered without destroying the original melody. That part, I I do really think that the relations between the parts, relations between elements, is in many important ways what it is that makes it a whole. Um, where the mirror is kind of critiquing that, I think, in a very kind of nuanced and very kind of like picking apart words in a very um, kind of picky way. I think that Aaron Fells is really kind of onto to something that Werthmer shares that view, but I think that I could see how Werthmer is kind of saying Aaron Fells, um, he's kind of just trying to oversimplify it into it's it's still this just like neat and tidy little seventh part uh, and it's just a sum, uh, summation of parts. Werthmer's view of wholeness is that the the system, the function, the relationship between the parts um, that has an orderly, orderliness to it, um, that is what makes it a whole. He just would not use that kind of wording of, oh, it's just this like seventh part and it's just a sum of these parts. Um, and so he says, Gestalt theory raised the question, is it really true that when I hear a melody, I have a sum of individual tones, pieces, which constitute the primary foundation of my experience? Is not perhaps the reverse of this true? What I really have when I hear of each individual note, what I experience at each place in the melody, is a part which is itself determined by the character of the whole. What is given me by the melody does not arise through the agency of any auxiliary factor as a secondary process from the sum of the pieces as such. Instead, what takes place in each single part already de depends upon what the whole is. The flesh and blood of a tone depends from the start upon its role in the melody. Uh, he says it belongs to the flesh and blood of the things given in experience, how and what role and what function they are in their whole. Um, and I really like this this part of the paper, this idea of um, kind of the direct experience. Again, this is very phenomenological, and I think that last part really reminds me of um, some of the idea, ideas of uh, phenomenologist um, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, and I'll talk about that in later videos, of the importance of like the flesh and blood, the given lived experience of, of a melody and how when we hear this whole melody, this whole song, um, there's like kind of an order and a, a theme to it such that we could take part of, of the melody and say, yes, this is, is part of a greater whole and it's unified in a certain way. It has um, maybe a feeling associated with it that um, pervades the whole, the whole song. And he'll talk a little bit later uh, in the last slide of the talk about this again. So he really says um, that it's not the parts that kind of determine the truth of the thing, it's the whole that really tells us what the truth is. And so just by looking at individual pieces of a song, 
that doesn't give us the truth. Um, that's not adequate. <coughs> and, and this slide is talking about how, um, again, he wants to pay attention to this, the lived situation. And so this applies to a critique that he has of um, kind of a behaviorist tendency to just look at like a simple stimulus response. Um, and that behavior is just a sum of stimulus and response in a very simplified kind of way. Gestalt psychology resists this and wants to um, to kind of pay attention to the field that the organism is in, and, and that's what this quote is saying, and also wants to pay attention to the total reaction of the organism. So a, a human as an organism has an attitude, striving, feeling, it has these kind of consciousness, um, and, and kind of freedom, a, a choice and awareness, um, in how it responds to an environment is not just a simple sum of uh, stimulus and response. Next, he talks about how Gestalt theory that he is proposing is a third way uh, beyond atomism and vitalism. First, he describes atomism, um, that this is kind of a, the view of like, we can just break things down into a sum of elements, and those elements are what truth is reducible to. Um, for example, the stimulus uh, response. Um, he says, what was said above of stimulus and sensation is applicable to physiology and the biological sciences, no less than to psychology. It has been tried, for example, by postulating sums of more and more sp special apparatus to account for meaningful, or as it is often called, purposive behavior. Once more, we find meaninglessly combined reflexes taken for granted, although it is probable that even with minute organisms, it is not true that a piece stimulus automatically brings about its corresponding piece effect. So he says it's just not that simple as, um, as stimulus and effect. Um, there's, there's something more complex, um, about how organisms, um, behave. And then opposing this view is vitalism. And so vitalism is basically kind of, you know, it's, it's what he is, is calling it. But, um, this idea that there's people who have this view that like, um, materialism is not adequate to kind of account for order. There needs to be something supernatural. There needs to be some kind of soul or just some kind of other thing, other entity, um, other factor that brings enough of an orderliness to, to life and, and to the universe, to reality, um, to satisfy these thinkers. They're not satisfied without this other factor. Um, so he says, uh, posing this view is vitalism, which, however, as it appears to Gestalt theory, also errs in its efforts to solve the problem. For it too begins with the assumption that natural occurrences are themselves essentially blind and haphazard, and adds a mystical something over and above them which imposes order. Vitalism fails to inquire of physical events whether a genuine order might not already prevail amongst them. And yet nature does exhibit numerous instances of physical wholes in which part events are determined by the inner structure of the, of the whole. Um, and so I think that this is very applicable to today um, in the field of philosophy. I think people have this very classic um, kind of back and forth between like materialism and idealism. And um, this is a big topic Um in all of this and in the work of Maurice Merleau-Ponty, um, Kurt Goldstein, they both had critiques of Max Werthmer that he was too materialist. They somehow have a distinct kind of view on how to balance these things, but um, I personally am fond of what Max Werthmer is saying here. It's like we don't need um, this idea of a soul or um, a mind, like capital M, mind of the universe for there to be order found in the universe. It's, it's innately there. Um, and so I, you know, I don't have the ultimate kind of knowledge of reality, but I do find that perspective convincing personally. Um, and I think this talk is just important partly because it is engaging with these really perennial questions that are still being raised today. Um, he says, these brief, brief references to biology will suffice to remind us that whole phenomena are not 
nearly psychological, but appear in other sciences as well. The fundamental question can be very simply stated. Are the parts of a given whole determined by the inner structure of that whole, or are the events such that, as independent piecemeal, fortuitous, and blind, the total activity is a sum of the part activities? Here is a place where Gestalt theory is least easily understood, and this because of the great number of prejudices about nature which have accumulated during the centuries. Nature is thought of as something essentially blind in its laws, where whatever takes place in the whole is purely a sum of individual occurrences. This view is the natural result of the struggle which physics has always had to purge itself of teleology. <clears throat> He, he then brings up the problem of body and mind, um, and, and this um, exploration of kind of the relationship of body and mind versus the dichotomy of the two is still going to be related to the slide that, that he just, um, that I just had. Um, it's, it's really bringing up the idea of kind of like uh, materialism and idealism and, and what some people find kind of not satisfactory about materialism. He says, let us proceed and ask, and, and ask, how does all this stand with regard to the problem of body and mind? What does my knowledge of another's mental experiences amount to, and how do I obtain it? There are, of course, old and established dogmas on these points. The mental and physical are wholly heterogeneous. There obtains between them an absolute dichotomy. From this point of departure, philosophers have drawn an array of metaphysical deductions so as to attribute all the good qualities to mind, while reserving for nature the odious. Um, later he says, uh, the ordinary person would violently refuse to believe that when he sees his companion startled or frightened or angry, he is seeing only certain physical occurrences, which themselves have nothing to do with the mental, being only superficially coupled with it. So he says, in our real life experience, we would, of course, resist the idea that there is such a dichotomy between body and mind. They're one thing. They are unified. I won't get too much into this. He next critiques intuitionists, um, but he says, this and other hypotheses apprehended as they are now will not advance scientific pursuit for science demands fruitful penetration, not mere cataloging and systematization. The question is, how does the matter really stand? And this is definitely one of the main um, thesis of, of this talk. So here he gets more to the, the question of idealism versus materialism and how it relates to body and mind. In the opinion of many people, the distinction between idealism and materialism implies that between the noble and the ennoble. Yet, does one really mean by this to contrast consciousness with the blithesome budding of trees? Indeed, what is so repugnant about the materialistic and mechanical? What is so attractive about the idealistic? Does it come from the material qualities of the connected pieces? Broadly speaking, most psychological theories and textbooks, despite their continued emphasis upon consciousness, are far more materialistic, arid, and spiritless than a living tree, which probably has no consciousness at all. The point is not what the material pieces are, but what kind of whole it is. Proceeding in terms of specific problems, one soon realizes how many bodily activities there are which give no hint of separation between body and mind. Imagine a dance, a dance full of grace and joy. What is the situation in such a dance? Do we have a summation of physical limb movements in a psychical consciousness? No, obviously the answer does not solve the problem. So separating these two things does not solve the problem. Um, what we encounter in our lived experience, the truth of that lived experience is a unification of our consciousness in our our physical bodies. And then uh, the last part, he says, when a man is timid, afraid, or energetic, happy or sad, it can be shown that the course of his physical processes is gestalt identical with the course pursued by the mental processes. So he says there's an alignment that we live out and we see in our own lives between my physical process, what my body is doing, and the way that my mind is, is uh, in that same moment. Um, in this part of the talk, he references the idea of Gestalt logic, and this is a really great and important um, point that he only just kind of barely scrapes the surface of, but is very substantially explored in his later paper called On Truth, 
It's a really great paper. I highly recommend it. And I'll be doing um, another video on that um, later. Um, he says, I have touched on the question of body and mind merely to show that the problem we are discussing also has its philosophical aspects. Um, to strengthen the import of the foregoing suggestions, let us consider the field of the fields of epistemology and logic. For centuries, the assumption has prevailed that our world is essentially a summation of elements. For Hume, and also largely for Kant, the world is like a bundle of fragments, and the dogma of meaningless summations continues to play its part. As for logic, it supplies concepts, which, when rigorously viewed, are but sums of properties. Classes, which upon closer inspection prove to be mere catch-alls. Syllogisms, devised by arbitrarily lumping together any two propositions, having the character, that, etc. When one considers what a concept is in living thought, what it really means to grasp a conclusion, when one considers what the crucial thing is about a mathematical proof and the concrete interrelationships it involves, one sees that the categories of traditional logic have accomplished nothing in this direction. It is our task to inquire whether a logic is possible, which is not piecemeal. So we see in, in parts of this paper, as I said, he really is interested in very kind of philosophical, um, epistemological questions. It's not just the research that he eventually does um, and is more well known for with the Gestalt psychologists on perception and and these things. Um, he's really a, a person who is very interested in truth and philosophy and these really more broad questions. And I think that his paper on truth is just really wonderful in how it explores this, that classical logic um, kind of sees things so abstracted and in isolation that it's poorer for it when it fails to see like the concrete lived situation the truth that can be found when we look at a situation and not just these kind of abstract ideas about the situation. It's kind of hard to talk about, but you'll understand it more if you read that paper on truth. Um, so he's just kind of throwing this in to talk about um, the need that he sees for um, a, a logic that is more kind of holistic. And then this is the last part of his talk. He kind of illustrates um, that contrasts Gestalt theory from other perspectives by describing three kinds of aggregates, the third of which is the kind that he, um, he sees, <coughs> that Gestalt theory um, kind of proposes. So first, how should a world be where science, concepts, inquiry, investigation, and comprehension of inner unities were impossible? The answer is obvious. The world would be a manifold of disparate pieces. And he's going to illustrate these three in the next slide. The second, what kind of world would there be uh, in which a piecewise science would apply? The answer is quite simple, for here one needs only a system of recurrent couplings that are blind and piecewise in character, whereupon everything is available for a pursuit of the traditional piecewise methods of logic, mathematics, and science generally, insofar as these presuppose this kind of world. So he says, if there was a, if the world was kind of adequately understood by the traditional methods of logic, math, and science, that world would not look like our world. Uh, the third uh, kind of aggregate is, um, he says, there is a third kind of aggregate which has been but cursorily investigated. These are the aggregates in which a manifold is not compounded from adjacent situ adjacently situated pieces, but rather such that a term at its place in that aggregate is determined by the whole laws of the aggregate itself. So this is what he proposes um, with Gestalt theory that holes determine um, the parts of the whole. Examples of these three kinds, he brings up again the example of a melody and a symphony. First, uh, so this corresponds to each of those three from the last slide. First, suppose that the world is a meaningless plurality. Everyone does as he will, each for himself. What happens together when I hear ten players might be the basis for my guessing as to what they are all doing, but this is merely a matter of chance and probability, much as in the kinetics of gas molecules. A second possibility would be that each time one musician played C, another played F, so and so many seconds later. I work out a theory of blind couplings, but the playing as a whole remains meaningless. 
This is what many people think physics does, but the real work of physics belies this. The third possibility is, say, a Beethoven symphony where it would be possible for one to select one part of the whole and work from that towards an idea of the structure, the principle motivating and determining the whole. Here the fundamental laws are not those of fortuitous pieces, but concern the very character of the event. So this, this third kind of aggregate is such that um, there's a unity among the whole. Um, in the symphony, there is relationship, uh, there's this order, it's not just this chaos, um, there's some kind of pattern or rhythm um, that unifies it. 